out. Uh, this week we have Clara Shi speaking to us, who is a 2004 scholar, um, and uh, we're really excited to have her. She's a great success, uh, and um, I'm really excited to hear about her journey from being a Marshall Scholar to a CEO, um, and I'm very happy that she agreed to do this because I know she's a very busy person. So I'm going to hand over. Thank you, Clara. Thank you, Mary, and good to see everybody, including some people from my class. Um, I really can't believe it's been 15 years, and one of my favorite motivational quotes is that we often overestimate what we can get done in a year, and we underestimate what we can get done in 10 years. So here we are, more than 10 years later. Um, and so I think we have a small enough group that we should try to make this as interactive as possible. I love Zoom chats, so just as you have comments or questions, you can pop them in there, and then I'll find times during my, my talk um, to answer them in real time, and then we'll try to save as much time as possible at the end for Q&A. Okay, so let me pop up my screen. So the topic of today is talking about the journey from Marshall Scholar to starting my own company and five lessons that I learned in the process of probably making every mistake that an entrepreneur can make and how that applies both to if you wanted to start a company or if you're considering joining a tech startup, as well as I think some of these lessons actually also apply to life. Um, okay, so quick um, bio on me. I had gone to Stanford prior to my Marshall Scholarship. I found out I got, um, I got the fellowship. I was really excited, but I had nine months before going to Oxford. So I got a job at a little startup um, down the street called Google. And um, it was kind of weird, right? It was, it was strange to go into the workforce and then be a student again. It was strange, but also fun to do that. Um, and then after my, my um, time at Oxford, I came back to the US. Actually, my dad um, had a stroke. And so it was like kind of um, very disruptive. Had to come back, um, be there for him. And then I um, found another job working at an enterprise software company called Salesforce. And while I was there, um, I worked in product marketing and product management. And long story, which I'll tell you on the next slide, ended up writing a book and starting a company. Okay, so what are my five lessons? My first lesson that I'm actually borrowing from another Marshall Scholar, um, Reid Hoffman, who, I don't know what year he was, but he, he you guys have probably heard of him. He, he founded LinkedIn and he's done a number of, of other really amazing things um, in tech and also outside of tech. And something that Reed has always said, which was influential to me, is that if you want to start a company or if you want to stand out just personally and professionally, the way to do it is to be an accurate contrarian. And those two words are really important because if you're accurate, but you're not a contrarian and everybody else has the same idea, then you're not, it's going to be a rat race, right? Because everybody's trying to do the same thing. And yeah, maybe like the very best person in the world will get it. Um, and then it's, and so being contrarian is really important. But when you're contrarian, it's easy to be wrong, right? Because it's like so unknown. And so you don't, what you don't want to be is an inaccurate contrarian or to not figure out pretty quickly that you're wrong. And so accurate contrarian theories are really important. How do you come across those? Um, generally, being bored is a good one. I know J.K. Rowling, she came up with the idea for Harry Potter because her train was delayed by four hours. Um, the other way is to cross domains, right? Usually, you know, cross-pollinating ideas from one to the other. Um, the other motto at our company is Shoshin, which is to come to things with a beginner's mind, not to assume that we're the experts, but actually to say, like, there's so much that, that I don't know and I want to learn. And then um, finally, just personal experience, usually tech disruptions create a lot of new opportunities, right? Think about how many companies um, were born out of the internet, how many companies were born out of um, the first mobile, um, mobile wave of mobile, and then the second wave of the iPhone. And so that's really what happened for me. So leaving um, Oxford, coming back to the U.S., taking six months off to be home with with my dad and help him through rehab and all of those things and then just being bored right actually like taking him to his appointments and being really bored and um, realizing that um, there was this thing called Facebook that was really starting to take off and the way that I crossed domains was that 
as you saw in my journey, I was working at an enterprise software company, a B2B software company called Salesforce, which was also not that big at the time. And it, it started, I couldn't, I, had, I started, got, started to get this idea that I couldn't stop thinking about, about how more and more B2B relationships would start to be affected by these consumer apps, consumer social networks like Facebook and LinkedIn. So much so that, as you saw and, and may have seen in Mary's email this morning, I actually cold reached out to, to Reed Hoffman, and LinkedIn was a tiny startup at the time, just wanting to, to meet him and, and get his thinking. And in our meeting actually confirmed for me even more that even in B2B, people would start to want to understand who the salesperson is who's calling on them, who is the insurance agent, who is the doctor, that they're potentially going to see. They'd start to Google them and want to understand their credentialing, maybe even their political views, who they are as a person before deciding whether to do business with that person. Um, and so based on that, I came up with this idea that you see on the left of connecting Facebook with Salesforce. And Salesforce is it's the it's a customer database um, of your customers. And the, the story about this is that I actually came up with this idea in early 2007. And by that time, it had been a few years since I'd written any software code um, because my job at, at Salesforce was more on the marketing and product management side. And I was trying to convince other people to build this app and no one would do it. People thought I was crazy, right? I was, I was, I was a contrarian and, no, and people thought I was inaccurate. And I just couldn't stop thinking about this idea. And so finally, I learned the, the new programming language of the day, um, which was PHP, and I just built this myself. And it changed my life. It was like this little app that changed my life because it went viral in the Salesforce community. And it started um, getting blogged about in a lot of the tech blogs out here, like VentureBeat and TechCrunch, as the first business app on, uh, sorry, the first social business app. Um, and then based on that, I started getting contacted by book publishers um, and, and Prentice Hall in particular, they said, hey, Claire, we, we read about you in VentureBeat. Um, how would you like to write the first business book about how Facebook can be used for marketing and sales? And I decided to go for it. I didn't have anything better to do. Um, I was bored. And so um, the idea was, you know, sometimes when you have an idea and you, you can't, you just can't let it go, even if you can't convince other people, if you're sure just, it's worth a shot, right? You could be wrong, but at least it'll be an adventure um, building it. And, and there are reversible versus irreversible decisions. Building Face Force is a horrible name, but that was the name that I came up with back then. And writing the Facebook era, my, my first book, those, were, those are not decisions that would, um, that I didn't have to give up anything in my current job to do those things. It was, it was nights and weekends. And they were, they were highly iterative projects until I found um, the app that really resonated with my customers and I, I got to a manuscript version that my editor found acceptable. Uh, okay, so that's the first lesson. The second lesson that I've learned is, is that, I mean, there's this very much, like I'm sure you guys have like read about this, um, this, this tech mantra about the, the innovation cycle and it's failure is part of the innovation cycle because you couldn't possibly know until you start. And it's about iterating and pivoting until you get something right, until something clicks. And so that's very much the first, I mean, we still do this today, but the cycles are longer because we have a, a large core business. But in 2009, I mean, it was idea after idea after idea. It was all these failed prototypes, people not picking up the phone when we tried to, answer, when we tried to call them, both customers as well as when we were trying to raise money, right? VCs not getting back to us. And really just about like developing that, that grit and maintaining conviction when you're getting 20 no's from VCs, knowing that you only need one, right? It's like getting married. You only you can get rejected from everybody, but as long as you get one, then um, you're good. And that's what happened to us. We, we, we got a yes from, from Sequoia, which is a great firm to, to raise from. And then we were able to, to go from there. In the early days, um, there, <clears throat> you don't have, even after you raise your series A or your angel round, um, you don't pay people very much, so there's this, there's very much this idea in, in tech about like paying people in options, and this is how some of the early employees at Google and Facebook, for example, um, created a lot of, 
of wealth for themselves through the equity. And so that's learning about how to compensate people and motivate people and convince people to walk away from really nice cush jobs to come work at your rinky dink startup that has no customers. That is, it takes a lot of, of hustle and it takes a lot of determination. And there was a lot of trial and error in learning how to do that. Um, because again, I got a lot of no's um, before I got our, some, started, started getting some yeses. Um, the other kind of um, unspoken or kind of like, um, not, it's not unspoken, it's kind of like the, 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 the kernel of wisdom is early on, right? Investors will, will guide you and they're right in hiring builders and sellers, right? Before we hire marketing, before we hire finance, before we, like you don't have any revenue yet. So there's nothing to do. So you're really focusing on builders and, and if you're B2B also sellers. And builders in the software world are software engineers. And so that's why you see so many founding teams, including my co-founder, Steve and I, we are both software engineers because before you can convince any engineer to come work for you, you kind of have to build the prototypes yourself or learn how to. Um, and, and prototyping to ultimately find what's called product market fit, right? Where you, it suddenly clicks and you, you know that it no longer feels like you're um, begging people to use your product or it's not just your friends and family using your product, but actually people, lots of people are using it. And in the B2B world, they're actually willing to pay for it. So here we are today, um, 10 years later, we're about 200, just over 200 people. Um, and yeah, like, I mean, we've got our core business, but it never ends, right? You're continuously learning, the market's continuously evolving. And what I've learned in the last um, two years has been this new, like my job keeps changing and I'll talk about that in a second, but this idea of it's no longer about survival, right? We're, we're surviving, we're, uh, we're close to profitable, but balancing cash profitability and growth. And generally the idea, the idea is if you can invest more and you can be confident that you'll grow, you'll, you'll have more users or you'll have more revenue, then it's, it, that's why so many um, startups are, are not profitable is because they're in that growth phase. But as you get bigger and your revenue get base and your expense base gets bigger, then it's more of a balance. Um, the second learning, which is ongoing, is this need for continuous reinvention. Um, last year, it was more like 18 months ago, we had a competitor just come out of nowhere and really start to eat our lunch in some cases. And it took us, took us a good year to figure out how to, to beat them. Um, but you just like, you can never like sit back and you don't like kick back and, and it's, it's done, right? It's um, um, very few companies have that type of monopolistic um, di market dynamics. And then the third learning has been, um, to quote another um, person that I, I, I know and admire, Mark Andreessen, is this idea that software is eating the world, that everyone these days, regardless of whether you're in higher education or um, healthcare or financial services, you need to understand software, tech, and AI, because these market forces are so changing every, um, every domain and like just how, as evidenced by how we're, we're all connected right now on Zoom. <clears throat> okay, so two more lessons, or yeah, two, three more lessons, and then we'll, we'll do Q&A. So lesson three um, has been really, this, this was like um, a lesson that I, was very painful for me to learn when our competitors started attacking us. And the reason why it took us a year to figure out how to um, fight back was because um, the company I had, Steve and I had founded was focused on social selling, right? Helping relationship managers use their social networks to build credibility and get referrals. And we were getting attacked on the social selling front. And so it actually took like a lot of painful trial and error to realize that the way to beat someone who's attacking you squarely in social selling isn't necessarily, like it's hard to just keep doing um, more, to do more social selling. Um, the, what we realized, and it was one of our employees who came up with this, was you got to change the game, right? You change the game so that it's not as directly competitive. And now um, it's like a bigger, you, you change that, you reframe the game so that you can win. And, but that's really hard to do. And the reason why it took us a year and a lot of sleepless nights and like tears and like really hard moments in our company is because by human nature, um, we are, there are four things that we're, we're fallible to, at least I, I am. The first one is there's a lazy default, right? It's like, 
it's easier to just keep doing what I've been doing the whole time. It's true for individuals. It's true for companies, right? We've been social selling. Our company name is Hearsay Social. Like we can't do anything else. It's our company name, but that's not true. We just re 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 renamed the company. All right. It's like, it seems so simple in retrospect, but like why, why didn't you think of it sooner? Um, the second one is this sunk cost fallacy, right? It's like, well, we've already um, put in six years and millions of lines of code and social, like we have to keep doing it. And that's also like, also not true. And we haven't stopped our social product, but we've just, we've diversified and done other things. Um, we've expanded. The third one is um, optimizing for what you're known for, right? It's like, well, externally, people know us as social selling. I wrote a book on social selling. Our company name is Hearsay Social. Like, I, I don't know. I feel like I have to live up to what I've told people. Well, no, like you can change that, right? Don't let you define the story. The story doesn't define you. Um, and then related to that, we were afraid to fail. I was afraid to fail. It's like, well, social selling, like I'm, we know that we've got social selling, you know, that's in the bag. I don't know anything, right? This goes to Kobe's question. I don't know anything about financial services. I don't know anything about compliance. I don't know anything about the, the technology of how text messages get sent. I don't know anything about, I actually didn't know anything about how AI worked at the time. Um, so I was scared of looking dumb. And, but, but that's like, you kind of have to work through that and that's where the growth happens. And so we did, and we significantly shifted what the company does. And today our social selling business is much bigger than it ever would have been if we hadn't become more. And I, I love this lesson because it also applies to us personally, right? Like many people, including me, um, oftentimes we let our past successes dictate our future. And the real person who like helped inspire me that this wasn't, that this didn't need to be so was the first manager that I had at Google. His name is Dennis Woodside. And he joined um, as a director of Google after having been a McKinsey partner. And before that, he had gone to law school and um, he went to Stanford Law School and he had clerked for a Supreme Court judge. And I said, Dennis, like, you could be such a great lawyer. You could be such a great McKinsey partner. Why have you taken five steps back title-wise and probably compensation-wise to work at Google? He's like, Clara, life is not, life is not a, it's not this linear race, right? And when you look for opportunities, you have to think broader. You have to think bigger. You can't be constrained by your past success and your past choices. Um, each day is a new day. Each year um, is a new year. Each decade, think ahead of where you want to be 10 years from now. And for him, that's not where he wanted to be. Okay, so lesson four, um, even within the same in the, in the, within the same journey, right? Because I was, I've, I've had the same job on, on paper for the last 10 years, because the company has changed so much, um, I've had to become a different leader every few years, right? And in in, in one of my um, entrepreneur friends, Bob Tinker, wrote this awesome book um, for, it's primarily for B2B entrepreneurs. I'm talking about like the personal growth that, that CEOs and actually all startup employees have to go through in order to be worthy to continue in their role, right? Otherwise you should fire yourself, which he actually did at his company. He, he started a company called Mobile Iron. And at some point he said, he said, I'm not Dwight Eisenhower. I don't enjoy it. I'm not good at it. I'm going to find someone who is to really lead the troops because we're a 5,000 person organization now. And it's, you know, it's, it's easy to kind of put this on the slide, but it's really painful to actually come to the realization that um, Davy Crockett, you know, blazing a trail, like cutting down the, the shrubbery and through the woods, like that's like, once you get into that mode, it's really hard to like unlearn and realize, okay, it's not just about me and my co-founder anymore. It's now we have to lead um, a, a team of early great warriors in the startup, right? That was the first learning. But then the hardest has really been the last three years going from that and going from knowing every single person on the team to being much more of like the architect, right? Not being in the front lines, not being the first person to jump on, um, on support questions, actually removing myself from the support email alias because we get 10,000 emails a day, those types of things. Um, but it's really hard because the very traits that make us successful sometimes earlier 
in our lives or in our careers are the same things that hold us back later on. And so a lot of um, reflection, a lot of um, self-awareness. Mary, I loved your, actually, I've got your, your to-do list that I copied for myself, right? I, I love this, right? Being mindfully present, like that's what gives us energy and time and space to reflect. Um, and it's also about choosing the right people to surround yourself with because we, we people feed off of each other's energy. And if someone's really positive or really negative, that affects you. Um, similarly, if you have guide um, counselors and advisors, as, as I, I've been very fortunate to have, who help you realize, well, Clara, you're being Davy Crockett right now. You really need to be Joan of Arc or Clara, you're, you're doing Joan of Arc things. Like you really need to empower your head of sales to do his thing. That's kind of helpful to have that um, check and balance and kind of feedback on an ongoing basis. Okay, so the last um, lesson that I've learned um, is, is that, you know, after all is said and done, like what does success really mean, right? It certainly shouldn't be defined by someone else. Um, at a certain point, we, we, sh we should all like just be thankful for having enough and for our health and for our relationships. And one thing that I realized um, that I got feedback from my friends and my husband on is that at some point, like, especially once you get to your company gets to scale, you, um, it, it's time to think about your priorities. Um, and so what I realized was I would always say that family came first, but when you looked at my calendar and my attention, it didn't match what I was saying. And so um, that's also been something that I've been, been working on, especially during the pandemic. That's been the silver lining is that I don't have to get on a plane and travel each week. And really thinking about like ways and hacks to honor my commitment, right? I shouldn't say that those are my values if I'm not going to act them out. And so some examples. So you can see on the left, um, I at work, right, often at work or in academia, we have recurring one-on-ones with our team and with our direct reports. Surely our closest friends and our family are more important than our coworkers. Why don't we have recurring meetings with them? Right, sacred times that people honor, that they show up on time for, that they're fully present for. Um, and I like it because then you, do, you, you remove the coordination cost and the cognitive load of having to schedule. So this is an example every Thursday night. I look forward to it, right? It's like when I'm having a tough day, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna talk about this over a glass of wine at, at girls' night. Um, in the middle, um, I've gotten to go all around the world as part of my, my job here. Say works, um, we have customers in 22 countries. And I've, I've used it as a way to um, bring my mom with me, right? It's like way more fun to have someone with me. My husband stayed, you know, can't, not as convenient to travel with our, with our um, son. So he's, he's usually at home, but my mom is available. And so we've gone all around the world together, um, over 20 countries, really exciting. And then um, in some cases, right, sometimes my, my husband and my, my, my son Blake come as well. Um, some other kind of like life hacks that I've developed um, the first one is like default no. So when people ask me to do something or invite me to a conference or invite me even to like social plans, my default is to say no. And I have to like justify if I'm going to make an exception. It just makes it a lot easier. Otherwise you're agonizing. It's like sitting in your inbox for days. You really don't want to meet up with that person. Like you don't even like that person. You're just super busy. You don't have time for your own kid. Like, so default no, just say no quickly um, and move on. Um, the second one is um, you can thank tech companies and tech AI for the endless stream of notifications, buzzes, and alerts that lure you to continuously basically spend all of your time on your phone. Um, and so be, be very careful, be wary of those. Um, I turn off all of my notifications, so I don't get any Slack alerts. I don't, my text message, like if you text me, it doesn't buzz, so that I get to choose on my terms when I wanna check. Um, and then talked about recurring personal time. And then, yeah, I've, I've learned, finally, it took me 38 years not to worry about disappointing other people. You can only live for yourself. Um, so that's, that's my prepared slides and would love questions.
Thanks, Kevin. So Kevin's question is about Silicon Valley and kind of gender issues in Silicon Valley. It's definitely, um, it's definitely a, a male dominated industry. Um, and I've had some tough personal experiences, but I've, um, the worst experiences I, I've heard secondhand through friends and coworkers of mine. Um, I think that the best way to solve that is to have more women and more diverse leaders in positions of power because generally like it just, they won't tolerate it. I don't tolerate it. Um, we, I mean, at Hearsay, unfortunately we've had some incidents over the 10 years where some issues have happened and, and we just like have a one strike you're out policy. Um, but it's about setting expectations, right? I think um, companies, company cultures are so interesting. There are these like organic things. And I find that they become as um, bad and as, or, or as naughty, it's like kids, right? They could become as bad or as naughty as you allow them to be, right? And so it's, it's, I am a strong believer, like you nip it in the bud, you set expectations up front. And then when an incident happens, because it does happen, they're, they're gone. And that sends the strongest signal um, possible. I, I, I am cautiously optimistic about some of the recent progress in terms of um, women-led venture funds and, and private equity firms, um, because that's where a lot of like the power and inv investment decisions happen. And that's, it's a, it's a demand um, issue, right? So limited partners, a lot of these large endowments and insurance companies that look to invest in venture funds are asking for funds with diverse investors are also allocating specific amounts to women-led um, venture firms. Women-led venture firms tend to invest in more um, diverse um, diverse founders. And so then diverse founders tend to, tend to hire more. So it's like this whole supply chain of talent that is really important to focus on. So great question, Kevin. Um, how to balance the default no to requests with also being service oriented, community minded, wanting to uplift and support other young women in the tech space. This is from Rebecca Peters. It's really hard. Um, I, um, I was less good at this earlier on, like before I had my son, frankly, I had a lot of free time before I had my son. Um, and so I, I would take these, but if you're not careful working in as a, as a tech leader or actually probably any of, of what you guys do, you could end up spending all of your time on like random coffee chats and going to conferences. And that happened to me like circa 2014. I looked back and I'm like, what did I do in 2014? I just like went to a bunch of tech conferences and like they, they're really inspiring and like they're interesting and you meet all kinds of people, but I'm like, I'm not doing anything really for my company or for myself. Like I'm getting some ideas or like having meeting with a bunch of random people. And so for me, I've had to, again, reflect inward in terms of there are, there are too many causes out there to, to make an, a meaningful impact on every single one. And so I've picked the causes that are important to me and the organizations that reflect those causes. So Girls Inc. is an organization that I think is tremendously well run. And so I, that's where I donate, that's where I mentor, that's where I help with their um, strategy. There's a few other organizations um, that I'm not as involved in, but I, I really um, have been thoughtful about where I want to focus my time. And then I'd rather do a lot for one or two organizations than do just a little bit random that doesn't make an impact for hundreds. Okay, um, Brittany, how did you go about identifying and approaching strong mentors? particularly when you were starting out. Um, there's so much that's available online today about people. Like I, I almost, I mean, no offense to my mentors because I really appreciate them, but I almost get more out of role models who I've never met than from mentors, right? Because you can just like read their blog, you can follow them on Twitter, you can watch endless numbers of talks they've given on YouTube and on podcasts. And that kind of gets you like 80% of the way there, right? Cause it's like the insight and then translating the insight to your own life. Like, yeah, it's helpful to have a mentor do that, but really like you need to do that yourself. 
right? And you can talk to your friends or, um, so that's like, that, that doesn't answer your question, but I'd say like, first, just keep that in mind. Don't feel like you have to, like your only way to grow is to find mentors. Um, the second is that uh, mentors, they have, they're like any relationship. They have to be organic, not artificial. And they have to be like, they have to benefit both parties, right? It's not like, can't be this like one-sided thing. Um, so the mentors that I found, I found they've either been people that I worked with, like probably my most famous mentor is Sheryl Sandberg. Um, but I met her like when nobody knew who she was. She was like a, ma a marketing man or a sales manager at Google. And you just like meet people over your lifetime. And some of those people end up doing really cool things and you want to talk to them about it. And if you, you had a relationship with them, they're usually um, interested in wanting to, to help you and, and to talk to you. So that's been one way. And then I shared the story earlier about Reid Hoffman. Again, very few people who knew who Reid Hoffman was at the time, right? He had started, he was an early PayPal person. He had started LinkedIn, but like LinkedIn had, had very little distribution. And so um, I think maybe the advice is to go after like people before they're mobbed and um, just like, there's so much information out there, like in people's LinkedIn profiles, papers they've written, talks they've given. And the thing I've learned is like, you're, you're rarely going to find everything from one mentor right? Like someone, it's like a specific thing that you want mentoring on. It could be um, a career decision. And even more specific than that, it could be about learning how to start a company or how to raise money. It's usually like mentoring about a specific issue. And so looking for domain experts, and there are a lot of them out there who might not be the most obvious ones that millions of people are contacting every day. Hope that helps. Me. Hey, I'll start with uh, live questions, if you like. <laughs> That's more fun. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm Grace. I'm actually in Mountain View, California right now. I am, um, and thanks for your talk. I was, I was thinking about what you said about the lazy default. I've certainly noticed that in myself. I was wondering, how do you catch yourself when you're in that mode? Um, yeah, because sometimes the easy way, like, is a fine way. I know, and, and often it's not, though. So I'm wondering what your strategies are there. It's really hard. That's such a good question because um, what it's at odds with is self-compassion. Mm -hmm. right? And so like, I find myself a little bipolar sometimes where I'm like, okay, I want to be self-compassionate and to be grateful for what I have. But then like something is gnawing at me. And like in that, in the case I gave earlier, it was our competitor eating our lunch. And I just like, wasn't okay with it. It felt wrong. And I, I actually couldn't relax until I resolved the issue. So yeah, yeah, I guess like, just be compassionate. Like you shouldn't always feel like you're um, working your tail off, right? Like we all need to, to recharge and to relax. Um, and it, lazy is kind of like, um, it's not fair, right? Because sometimes we just need yeah. to focus on other things. But if there's something that you really want to do and that five years from now, in, in 2025, you look back and you're like, gosh, like, I really wish I had tried that. I really wish I'd gone there. I really wish I'd talked to that person and that you're going to regret it. Then you should, you should do it. I like that. Thanks. Sure. Um, I like the live questions. Lucy, do you want to ask yours? Why not? Um, hi, thank you for chatting. Um, so I loved your kind of timeline uh, with Braveheart in there. But I know I've been in some startup settings, not the same style that you have, but I know shifting from like kind of being a warrior to an architect is like a really tricky learning curve for me. Um, just because like a few years down the line, you're trying to get that sustainability. I was wondering if you could talk a bit about like what you've found to be helpful for that transition. Yeah. So we're, I mean, we're, it's, we're still doing, we're, we're still in the middle of doing it at, at 200 people. And the reason we know that it's time is that people are getting burned out. And even before the pandemic, we, we were losing some of our best warriors um, because they just like were so, they were constantly in firefighting mode and hero, um, hero mode, solving things one off. And um, what our new COO that we hired, I hired him in March. So he's like just before things shut down. What he's taught me, and he's been an executive for, for many decades, is that at some point, like if you see recurring patterns, like usually your fires like fall into themes and he's taught me root cause analysis and the importance of putting in place process 
And there, there is a way, like I, I never went to business school, but there's like the, the, we used in Silicon Valley, there's like MBAs sometimes get a bad rap, but they actually, it's actually really valuable to know those constructs um, and to, to put process in place. And there is a way to manage through and prioritize and put systems and, and look for, for talent gaps, for example. Like we realized that there were certain roles that were missing. And so we were compensating the, for those gaps for too long um, with warriors who are very versatile and can do anything, but then you, you can only do that so long before you, you wear out your warriors. So that's been, that was the sign that we needed to do something. And then right now we're trying to figure out, and it is a combination of um, people and process. And in some cases, some, some technology systems, right? We, we were getting all these support tickets. I was telling you earlier, I used to be copied on all of them because I, I used to answer them myself. And then at some point we hired a support team, but then as we onboard more and more customers, the answer isn't just to keep adding more support reps. You have to start doing like self-service, right? A lot of people just want to have a quick question, let them look it up for themselves. Chatbots, like different smart ways to scale. Um, and that's how you architect something that's more sustainable. Cool, thanks. Yeah, I'll ask the next question. Thank you so much for the Frank talk. Um, so I'm actually, I loved your lesson about sort of giving yourself freedom to reinvent yourself, right? Even, even though you've been sort of settled in some earlier roles. So I've been an economist by training and this year I'm transitioning into a role as a venture capitalist. Um, we're funding sort of uh, startups out of Eastern Europe. Um, so I would love to hear sort of, you know, in that journey in the relationship with your VC investor, what are some qualities that you really enjoyed um, uh, sort of in the engagement with the VC investor? So what makes sort of an effective counterpart uh, and a helpful, I guess, um, advisor to you as a founder? I guess, what type of investor? Um, so I've had two VC investors, so I, I don't have like a big sample size to analyze, but I've, I feel like I've been really fortunate because what I hear, like the horror stories that I hear, like from my husband, who's also a, a founder, is sometimes there are like career investors who have never run or worked at companies themselves. They're like more like in former investment bankers. And sometimes like listening, like they, they, um, just to temper, if you're one of those people, you can simply still be really valuable, but tempering your advice um, and just trying to like understand more where the entrepreneur is coming from. I feel really fortunate that both of my VCs have been operators. So Brian from Sequoia um, was an early employee at Google and he built out businesses from scratch. So he's been, he, he's, I mean, more so early on, but just like helping accelerate my learning, helping me um, hire people and figure out what good looks like. Because that's one of the really hard things is when you're a startup founder, most 99% of startup founders have, have only played one or two roles, right? For me, I'd been an engineer and a PM and done marketing, but like, I didn't know anything about sales. I didn't know anything about finance, accounting, recruiting, like any of the other functions. And so if having not done those, it was really hard for me to know what good looks like when I was hiring those people. So he was really hands-on, like helping almost like as a coach, I think the early stage investors are good, um, are good coaches and they help with recruiting. The second investor that we got, um, John from, from NEA, he was a former entrepreneur. And so he's like got that warrior mentality and um, he's been really helpful for just like helping encourage us to continue when we wanted to give up, which was every other week in the early, early years. Cause it's really hard. It's really hard to get that many rejections all the time from customers and from VCs. And it just takes like unbelievable resilience. And I personally, I, I don't think I had it without someone like helping keep my mind in the game. So be as helpful as you can, but don't like impose. <laughs> Thank you. So I guess a bit about stepping into their shoes and, you know, thinking of them as well through their journey, which is a, uh indeed something that you don't immediately sort of uh, think about if you haven't done that journey yourself, right? Yeah, and then there's ways you can help. Like early on, like now they really advise us or, you know, board of directors, but in the, in the early days, you're so understaffed that John like helped us. I, I'll, I'll never forget this one incident where um, he worked his connections from his last startup to get us an introduction to the CIO, the head of IT at UBS, which is a big bank. And we were really like excited about meeting with this person. 
And, but he, he set it up, I think he had been trying to set it up for many months, but he finally like confirmed on a Friday that this guy was available on Monday in New York and we're in San Francisco. And the reason why it was so short term is like, this guy didn't really want to meet with us. And he also travels a lot. So he, he happened to have been home in, in New Jersey on Monday. And so my co-founder and I, we booked our, our flights. We um, were on the Sunday night red eye to Newark to meet with this guy in the morning, uh, but we were pretty woefully unprepared. Um, we had our deck, but we really didn't know very much about UBS and we were trying to research, but it's like kind of hard to, to parse through all the information. So John, he was six months into being our, our investor. He kind of knew this and he wanted us to look good and he wanted us to set us up for success. But he like, it was the weekend, he had all these things with his kids. And I'll never forget, um, Steve and I showed up to the airport on Sunday night and um, we like go through security, we go to our gate, we're like kind of groggy, right? We're ready for the red eye. And then John's right there. I'm like, how did you get through security? I think he bought a plane ticket to get through. And he was there with a binder and notes. And as we were waiting for our flight and as we were boarding, he was prepping us and talking. And that's just kind of like things that make investors stand out and make founders really loyal to them. Thank you. Um, Kobe, did you have a question? Yes, I kind of wanted to follow up on that question on the VC question, just asking, maybe going back to 2009, a little bit more of the story of why you decided to go down the VC route and also like how you approached early hiring. Um, I know you talked a bit about that, but just wanted to know a bit more. Yeah, um, so in 2009, we went, we, we raised, and, and do you mean like why we decided to raise it all or why we specifically decided to raise from VCs? versus other investors? Um, I guess all of the above. Okay. Um, so Steve and I um, started in 2009 and we were just coding and like doing all this stuff. But we, we didn't have an office and we didn't have any employees and we didn't have any money to, to hire employees. So we knew we had to raise money and we had been planning to. Um, so the initial thought is like oftentimes companies will raise an angel round right from angel investors that are more like individual or like small firms rather than like a full venture venture firm and so we um we we found a few angel investors and one of our angel investors his name is thomas layton and he was um the ceo of open table and before that the founder and ceo of city search um, back in the 90s he he was basically like he did a great thing he said um it's like, look, you can raise this angel round, but then you'll be back at it fundraising again in a year. And it's just very time consuming to fundraise. He's like, honestly, guys, like I think what you have and your early customers are so strong that um, I think you can like skip the angel round. He's like, it's against my interest to do this because I'll have to pay at a higher valuation, but I'll, let me introduce you to some VC firms because we think you're ready for, for the big league. So that's how it happened. It was really thanks to him that we were able to avoid an additional round of dilution um, and we went up and down Sand Hill Road and we pitched, again, many VCs and we got mostly no's and then we got one yes. And then in terms of hiring, it's really, really hard. Um, and it's harder now than it was in 2009 when we started. Um, the reason is because like everyone wants to start a company. Like why would they come work for you when they can start their own company? So that's why it's so important in the early days. Like Steve and I really had to, um, build up our, like we had to build the prototype, we had to get the first customers, we got funding. And that was really, after that was when we were able to, to um, hire, to hire people. That makes a lot of sense. Thanks so much. Sure. Any other questions? I, I have a question. So you, um, I'm Claire, I'm uh, also in San Francisco, um, but in medicine. You um, talked about changing career vision or changing, you know, the direction of a company. Um, but with that comes leaving something behind. And if you've been somebody that created that thing that you're leaving, how do you let go of that thing? Or when do you know, what do you do with the thing that you're leaving to pursue the new vision? It's so hard. Um, I've personally not done this, but my, my husband, um, he started a company called Halo Neuroscience six years ago. Um, it's like a health tech startup and he left 
last year. So I've been watching like from the sidelines going through this and it's, it's like really gut wrenching, especially when it's a company that you've personally founded. Um, but I think there, you know, there's various circumstances under which when that makes sense, right? In his case, like um, there was, I mean, probably shouldn't share too much, but like, it was like some, there's sometimes like it just doesn't serve you and you're not happy doing that every day. You don't feel like you're growing either because you've, you've started to, to asymptote in terms of your learning or because there's a lot of, there's conflict with a co-founder or with your board. Um, and that conflict is standing in the way of you being happy and learning and growing and doing your thing. Um, so that's, that's often what happens in startups. Um, there's a lot of famous and also less famous stories of like founders getting um, pushed out of their own companies or choosing to leave their own companies because of those factors. Um, in kind of non-founder situations, like when you've worked at a place, like for me, like I really enjoyed working at Salesforce. Um, and I was scared um, because I don't have like any type of, you know, family wealth or financial safety net. I was scared to leave a very nice job in the midst of the 2008 crisis. And for me, again, I, I used the five-year rule. I said in five years and in 2013, and I look back, will I be glad? Like, where, will, where do I forecast myself to be? if I stay at Salesforce and continue to spend, I've spent three years, do I spend another three years? Like, where am I going to be? Versus where will I be if I start a company, if it succeeds and if it fails? And I ultimately concluded that um, I would like always live with regret if I didn't try because I was so interested in, in entrepreneurship and startups. And I concluded that if I failed, i.e. if I ran out of money or I couldn't raise money, that I would be able to find another job like the one that I had at Salesforce. Hi, I um, thanks so much for speaking with us. I apologize, I had to step away a few minutes ago, so I'm not sure if you were able to address the question that I had put in the chat, but I was curious what your inspiration is for new ideas, both you and your team, in an environment where you're you're constantly innovating, you know, especially when you were in the early stages or facing competitors and just you were talking about coming up with idea after idea. Yeah. Um... Well, it's easier to come up with new ideas when there's a new technology disruption, right? Like it's hard to come up with an idea for a mobile app now because mobile is, is so like old school. Um, it's hard to come up with an idea for a new social media app now. Not that you can't, right? Please don't feel discouraged. But like people have had 10 years to come up with ideas. Um, what really helped us, and this is like you have to pick your, your domain wisely, like the same with, um, I think this is true in academic research. My, mom, my, my brother is a professor, right? If you pick something that is like a really old, um, long-standing field, like to do something really new and breakthrough, like it's hard, right? Like people have been like, I don't know, thinking about philosophy and thinking about um, his domain is like political science for a really long time. Um, it's not impossible. And many of you guys do amazing work and it's so inspiring, but it's just easier um, to like when there's a change, when there's a regime change, when Facebook just came out, it's just this like Cambrian explosion, right? Opportunity of people to come up with ideas because there's a new platform that changes the world, right? Facebook at the time, LinkedIn at the time, they were changing the world and literally there were no experts because it was so new. And so anyone could be an expert. I could be an expert and I became one. Um, and so trying to look for those types of opportunities. And so it goes back to the earlier point too about Oftentimes we can create those opportunities too by cross pollinating, right? Even if there's no new disruption by taking dom one domain to another, right? This is what my husband's new company is doing. He's taking software and AI to brain to neurology. Like not very many people have do that. So then you create your own opportunities because most people who work in neurology PhD labs don't understand how software and AI works. And then conversely, most people in software and AI don't understand how the brain works. Oh, um, I had a follow-up question, if I could. I don't sure. want to like 
hog anything. I just, I loved how you're talking. We're all kind of at this big transitional time um, in our lives. I mean, as kind of a world, but also individually. Right. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm just finishing up the first year of my scholarship. And I was just wondering, how have you been able to define what success looks like for you? Because I feel like that could change with so many factors. Like you have a kid, it's probably changed things. But if you could give any kind of insight on that, that would be really helpful. Yeah, I've thought a lot about it. Um, I can't speak, like, I don't know most of you, so I can't, I'm not going to project this on you, but I'll just talk about myself. Um, for a, like a lot of my own ambition and the, the people that I'm close to, ambition came initially from um, a place of like not feeling worthy and not feeling like I had enough or not being enough, right? Mo a lot of people like Howard Schultz, who I've gotten to know, um, since I'm on the Starbucks board, like he, he came from a place of not having enough, not feeling like he was enough. I certainly did too. And that ambition drives people to do amazing things, to found Facebook, to found Apple, to um, become a Supreme Court justice. Like it, it drives amazing things and we should harness that, right? Because many, like most people in the world, like unless they feel really entitled, at some point feel like they're not enough or they don't have enough. But at some point, you got to like be self-aware of it and you got to turn it off because otherwise it'll become toxic and it'll take over your life and you'll never be happy. And so the most um, work that I've done, I highly recommend like counseling. I've like, I do it all right. Personal therapy, executive coach, marriage counseling, because this, this journey to inward to understand yourself and what drives you is so important. And if you truly want to be happy and truly want to uncover what's important, you have to understand like these fear, like these deep seated fears that each of us have about not being enough or not having enough and then recognize them and then start to use those for good, but not be controlled by them um, and become, for example, in my case, like if I hadn't conquered it, I'd become a workaholic and not spend any time with my family. Thank you. Yeah, it's, Maybe it's a, a follow-up question, yeah. and this is becoming much more deeper now. <laughs> um, I guess now that you've gone through that inner sort of or search for inner balance, uh, if you may call it that, what it, what are some life hacks in, in now that you're trying to raise a child in trying to establish you know that sense of um, uh, I guess feeling enough and loved and sort of versus you know this external push for ambition and accomplishment and investing in you know sort of tiger parenting that yeah. probably you know, some of us would, would do um, at some point, you know, in, in this, so finding the balance between this, uh, having now come to it from your own journey. It's true. I mean, because the thing is, there's always another degree. There's always another award. There's always another zero you can add to your bank account. And, and yet, if you don't, like, figure out um, what, if you don't internalize that you are enough and each of you are are enough. I don't know you, but I know you that you are, and I know I'm enough. Um, then it never ends, and you like ends up being like a very sad life. So the way that I do that now is just like acknowledging that and like reminding myself and creating space to reflect. Um, and again, like I, I time audit myself. I showed you my my calendar earlier, but I actually try to measure at the end of every quarter how much time I spent at work with my friends, with my parents, by myself, with my husband and w as a family, with our son, just because like I wanna, I like just to know how I'm spending my time. Um, and I don't know how you guys are, like for me, if I schedule something, it becomes my life. So just putting those blocks in are really helpful, is really helpful to me. And then in all seriousness, like Mary's checklist is so helpful too, because when, when you're in a bad, when we're in a bad state and we're stressed, um, the tendency is to keep doing the workaholic thing or to like endlessly scroll on social media because those are escapes. And it's very important either through, and people have different things, right? It could be exercise, it could be yoga, it could be meditation. I love this, right? Like it's so simple. I, I literally follow your list, Mary. I drink water each day. I shower, I clean one thing um, because I don't have my cleaning person anymore. I tend to something growing. This is the first time in my life I haven't killed all of my house plants. And then being mindfully present 
to a sound or a song, a sensory feeling, something you see in a spiritual practice. Like, so simple. I can't take credit entirely because it was something I found and shared, but I, I found it really useful. And I think, you know, those are very simple things that everybody can do to sort of bring themselves to the present, I suppose. Yeah, and that's such a good way of putting it because for us, like to become a Marshall Scholar because of how competitive it is, we are all really good at delayed gratification. And to be good at delayed gratification, by definition, you don't live in the present. And so that's one of the things where what got us to this place, we have to unlearn at some point for the second half of our lives. So maybe I'll just leave you guys with that and um, thank you again for, for spending the hour with me. Clara, thank you so much for taking the time and spending an hour with us. I think um, you're an inspiration. You really are. And I, I found it really interesting to hear your ideas and I think they apply to life in general not just for startups and business so I think even I at my old age will take away some of your your hacks because I think they're they're really good so thank you very much thank you everybody for joining us um uh this has been absolutely fantastic and I look forward to sharing it so that other people can see your your um wisdom around especially being a woman and being a CEO, which I think is an added challenge sometimes, especially when you're trying to balance life as well. So thank you very much. Um, and everybody else, I hope to see you next week for our next Marshall Hangout. Thanks, Clara. Thank you.